Someone took a good chair here. Come on. This is crazy. I just noticed that now, and I'm, you know, it's weird. I think there's a, there was a better chair here. Are any of you guys sitting in a good chair? All right. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Uh, well, anyhow, we'll try, to, we'll try to struggle on despite this uh, hurdle. Uh, today we're going to talk about mobile stuff. All right, and um, we're going to go, um, we're going to sort of give an overview of the mobile world and how it's relevant to developers and how it's relevant to an organization. I think it's important to put this in context. Um, and then we're going to talk specifically about the basics of making your page work on a mobile device, what you need to do, what, it, what the characteristics are of a website that is um, that works well in, in a mobile environment. First of all, if you're talking about an organization putting something in the mobile environment, allowing people to access content or services that the organization provides on a mobile device, you're talking about two possibilities. You're talking about, first of all, Mobile web pages and apps. That's sort of the two, two main ways that an organization can give themselves a mobile presence. about the relative advantages and disadvantages. One thing to remember is that when, whenever there's an alternative way of doing something, there better be some advantages and disadvantages to both. Because if there was an alternative of different ways of doing something, and one way only had advantages, and the other way only had disadvantages, well, there wouldn't be an alternative, right? You would just use the one that had the advantages and you'd forget about the other one. All right? So when I talk about a mobile web page, what am I talking about? How do you access a mobile web page on a mobile device? Through a browser, just like you access a regular web page on a computer. So every mobile device, and when, again we're talking about smartphones, but even some of the lower end phones have a web browser. So you go and you put in the address of the website and you go to that site and you can view it. And once you view it, it's like, it's like in many respects surfing the web on a regular computer. You can navigate around through clicking links, you can type in the address of sites, you can bookmark sites. It's just like surfing the web on a desktop machine in this respect anyhow. Um, what about an app? What's an app? How do you access an app? It's an executable file. That's true. From a user's perspective though, how is it different? Right. First of all, with a mobile web page, you don't have to download anything. Your, your device is going to have a browser on it. So you don't require any special software to access a mobile website. You simply use your browser to go to that. All right. With an app, however, you have to have downloaded the app. And again, either from typically the Google Play Store or the, the Apple App Store. So the first thing you do is you download the app to your machine, all right, your device. It's probably a better way to put it than machine. All right, so that's one difference. What's another difference? Sometimes you have to pay for apps. Um, sometimes you have to pay for web pages. There's web page, websites that have premium content, all right. But yeah, that's, that's a difference. So 
mobile web pages, access through a browser. Must be downloaded. Device. Here's a couple things that I think are generally true statements. Apps are generally very focused. In other words, they give you and they direct you through the two or three things that the app does and that the app does well. Whereas with the web, it's more of a free form browsing experience, like when you browse the web a desktop device. Apps have to be written for a specific, specific device. Whereas mobile web pages are available to any device with a browser. Believe me, that's anything. All right. I can pull up web pages on my old Nintendo DS. All right. I don't have to download an app for that. All right. It's on the web. That means that as long as I have a browser, the web browser guarantees that within certain limitations, I can access any content via the device. The app, however, has to be written for a specific device. In other words, there is a different Android app than there is an iPhone app. Now, the aim of course would be to make them work identically, but it's uh, from a developer's perspective, you have to develop two apps. One that works on Android, one that works on iPhone. And you always run into the possibility that someone's going to have a platform that's not supported. For example, a Windows phone. All right, the two people in the world that have Windows phones aren't able to download and, and run certain apps because Windows phones typically don't have as many apps installed. And again, it gets to be a vicious cycle, right? Because, because Windows uh, phones have fewer apps, less people are interested in buying them, which means that app developers don't develop as many apps and so on. All right. Whereas Android and iPhone, I don't know the exact statistics, but my guess is... Neither one of those exhibit a huge dominance. In other words, it's a pretty even split. So if you're an organization, chances are you're going to have to develop your app for a um, Android and for iPhone. Now, if you're a game developer, then you can kind of focus on one thing, right? Because you're not you're you're trying to sell games and you're trying to sell games or sell the advertisements in the games or something like that. So you could focus on that. But if you're an organization that wants to get your message out to the world, you know, Chipotle has an ordering app that you can download to your phone. All right? I'm sure they have an Android and iPhone version of the app because they don't want to give away half their business, right? They want to make sure that anyone that wants to order a burrito Anyone being defined as anyone with an iPhone and an Android phone, I doubt they have a Windows version, but they might even, but can go and download it. But the thing is, from a developer's perspective, it's written for a specific device. A mobile web page isn't. A mobile web page is simply a web page in anyone. You have a flip phone with a browser. You can access a web page. Now, how that web page works on a flip phone is a different question, but you can at least access it. Uh, on all those devices. All right. Generally, it's more focused. You know, with a website, you know, it, it's both good and bad. A website allows you to explore, click links, go to external links, and so on. An app tends to be very focused. If it's a weather app, you're going to open it up and it's going to show you your weather, boom, in your face. It's not going to show you about a blizzard that's going to hit in the Rockies or anything like that. All right? It's going to be very focused to one task and it's going to have a neat little nice icon on your desktop or, or, or screen top. 
So if you want the weather, you don't have to open a browser and type in www.weather.com or whatever. You click on the Weather Channel icon, boom, there's your weather forecast. So it's very focused. All right? So this is kind of the good news and bad news of both of them. Here's the spoiler alert, all right? Here's how this ends up. As an organization, you're probably going to want to cover all your bases. You're not going to say, well, I have an app. I don't care how my, how my web page looks like on a mobile device. So, for example, CNN. All right? CNN has their regular website. They have a website customized for mobile, and they have a CNN app. All right, they actually probably have several CNN apps depending on like what your focus is on. You could probably download a CNN technology app and just get technology news stories or a world news or a national news or something like that. Many organizations have things like that that are very focused because that's what people want with apps is focus, the ease of experience of clicking as opposed to opening up a web browser and having to figure things out and navigate things. All right. So an organization is typically going to try to have to cover all the bases. All right. We don't talk about developing apps in this class. All right. That is covered in some other classes that we have on campus. There's an intro to iPhone development, which is CISS 260, I think. There's an introduction to Android development which is currently CISS 265, but will be renumbered to CISS 264 starting next semester, starting fall semester. And then there's an advanced Android development course. So if you want to learn how to develop apps, take those courses, all right? Because we don't talk about them in there. They're problems in themselves. In fact, you know, developing an iPhone app is a problem. Developing an Android app is a problem. These are all topics, these are all big topics, so we don't have time to cover them here. Mobile web development, though, we do have a time to at least cover. There's another class that takes it further, and that's CISS 268, which is mobile web development. So let me talk about the, the, the alternatives you have as far as getting your web page able to be viewed in a mobile environment and also a desktop environment. Number one is one size fits all. In other words, I have one web page or I should say one set of web pages that works and looks good and is effective on a desktop device, on a desktop computer, on tablets, on phones. And that might sound hard, but depending on the kind of site you have, it might not be that hard to do. For example, a smallish sort of site like a site for a restaurant, all right? A site for a restaurant, if you go to uh, a restaurant, uh, you know, you pick a restaurant and you, you go to their site, um, there might be five or six links, you know, uh, about the site, depending on the kind of restaurant, whether it's a chain restaurant or fast food or, or a fancy restaurant, all right? But there's not going to be tons of stuff on the site. There might be a home page. There might be a page about how to contact them for reservations. There might be a page that shows a menu, a page that shows the hours, that sorts of things. That's relatively easy to make a site that's going to be effective across the different platforms because you're not talking about tons of information. All right? The techniques to do this are called responsive web development. And responsive means that the web page is responsive to the environment that's being displayed on. In other words, you display it on a, a, a mobile device, it responds to that. And it figures it out and it makes it look good in a 
mobile environment. You display it on a desktop environment, it works good on that as well. All right? And there's techniques to do this. All right? Because you don't want your web page to fill up a mobile phone like that, but on a big browser window be displayed like a postage stamp like that. All right? So you want it to expand to take up the space to, to, to do that. All right? A second alternative is to have one set of pages and use scripting. And we don't, don't talk about scripting a lot in this class, but client side is JavaScript. And server side scripting, which is PHP, ASP.NET, etc., to customize the page. And we can customize the page for more things than whether you're on a mobile site or not. For example, if you've ever uh, gone to a site to download an application, all right, um, you, you know, you're, you're going to go and download some open source tool, all right, maybe Audacity for um, audio recording, all right. Some websites are smart enough to know if you're coming from a Mac or a PC, right. And if you're coming from a Mac, it will show you the link to download the Mac version of the application. If you're coming from a PC, it will show you the link to download the PC version of the application. If you're coming from a Linux machine, it will show you the link to download the Linux version of that. So in that case, there's one set of pages, but the page is smarter than your standard HTML page. It has some code built into it, some scripting that looks at who is making the request. By who, I mean what kind of system is making the request. And then based on that, it will customize the content of the page. All right? Um, you, can write, you can write pages that are smart enough, for example, to know whether you're on a mobile phone or not. And if you're on a mobile phone, it will actually create a link for you to dial a company's phone number. All right? Let's Google my insurance agent. Free advertising for him today. Mark Swain State Farm. All right. Notice what we have here. We have the information to him and so on and it displays a phone number. Let's go and Google them from my phone. And I hope I can display it. I can't. You have to trust me. Let me zoom way in. All right, right here, there's a link to actually call him. All right. In other words, Google is smart enough to know, hey, this person's now on a phone. This person isn't on a desktop. You can't call from a desktop. But if I press the call button, it brings up my phone, the dialer. I just have to hit the dial and I can make the call. So that sort of falls in the category of there's one set of pages, there's one Google search, but it's smart enough to know, hey, this person's on a phone, so I'm going to display the results different for them. I'm going to give them a link to dial instead of simply displaying the phone number as text. All right? So this allows for even greater degrees of customization. Last but not least is 
having two different websites. Depending on what kind of device you're on. So let me open up my browser. Okay, I go to eBay. So I type in eBay.com up here. And where do I go to? I go to www.ebay.com. That's my URL. I go to, in my mobile browser, I type in eBay.com. I have to take my word for it, but if you look in the address bar, the address is different. It says m.ebay.com, m standing for mobile, all right? So what happened there? What happened there is this, that on the web server, there's a traffic cop, all right? Not really a traffic cop, all right? This is a metaphor, all right? Remember we said, and we drew this diagram, that the way web browsing works is you have a client that connects to the internet and makes requests to a web page. So I type in ebay.com. That request gets routed through the internet. And you have to listen, you have to attend one of Don Huffman's classes to find out how it gets routed, because we don't talk about that in this class. Somehow it makes it to the web server. And the web server, in this case eBay's web server, will deliver back to you a web page, an HTML document. And that's how it typically works, right? Now, when you have a separate website, there's a little snippet of code, that is your traffic cop. And it will send you a different HTML document. It will actually direct you to a slightly different web page depending on whether you're on a mobile device or a desktop device. All right. So, that way, you can make the page totally different for a mobile user than for a desktop user. So, which one of these approaches should you take? Well, you have to decide. A lot deals with how big and how complicated your website is. A simple website, the one-size-fits-all mentality would likely work like I mentioned before, for a restaurant. You know, you go to a restaurant and chances are you could make a restaurant, the web page for a, a restaurant, work well across a bunch of different platforms. If you have an extremely complicated and involved site like eBay, you probably want two separate sites and you want a little bit of, little snippet of code that works as a traffic cop to direct you one way or another. And if you're somewhere in between, you might have one set of web pages that uses some scripting to accommodate the differences between platforms. All right? So the more complicated you are, the more different you're going to want your pages to look. All right? Why not have the pages always be the same? Why give people different content on a mobile device versus a desktop device? Two reasons. Why should they even be different? Why not always use the one-size-fits-all 
and gives everyone the same page. Number one, the physical differences. Screen of a mobile device versus screen of a of a uh, desktop or laptop. That's a big difference, right? <coughs> that affects how much content you can display on each page. That also affects how you can lay it out. For example, on a wide screen like this, a multi-column layout might work very well. On a small screen like this, a multi-column layout might not really fit very well. So you're better off having a single column layout. All right. The other thing is that people act differently when they're browsing on a mobile device versus on a desktop computer. And when I mean they act differently, I mean they're typically looking for different stuff. All right. Can you imagine accessing Elsie's website on a mobile device? Um, that might not be the best example. I have a hard time imagining accessing it on a desktop device sometimes, but let alone a, a, a mobile device. But let's think about it. When might you be accessing Elsie's website from a mobile device? What kind of information might you use your mobile phone to try to pull up from Elsie's website? <laughs> exactly. That's like the number one answer. Is the school closed? Ooh, look, a couple snowflakes. Maybe they canceled class, right? What's something else that you might want? You might, uh, someone's phone number. What's the phone number for the fitness center? What's the fitness center's hours? Um, how do I call the library? Whatever. The thing is, is you're not going to sit down, prob probably not, you're not going to sit down and plan your career or plan what courses you're going to take over the next couple of years on a mobile device. For something like that, you're probably more apt to be sitting down at a desktop machine and browsing that way. So people look for different content when they're browsing on a mobile device than when they're browsing on a desktop device. People are usually are looking for very pointed questions that they have and that they want answers for. Again, that's why perfect answer is the school closed. All right. That's a pointed question that if I'm stuck in traffic and this, I'm in the middle of a blizzard, I want to know that. And I don't want to have to mess around clicking 15 different links to get to that. I want that answer to be in my face when I go to that. Likewise, if I want to go to, uh, to, to call to see what the hours of the library are or, or whatever. All right. I don't want to mess around going through. I want this, this stuff in my face. So as a general rule, all right. Everything about a mobile device is liable to be smaller, less powerful than a desktop device or a laptop. Now again, you know, the gap is certainly narrowing, right? And I mean, you got some powerful processors in phones these days. But still, they're always going to lag a little bit behind desktop devices you probably are going to be on a slower internet connection than you would be if you were on, say, uh, a computer in the lab or your own computer at home. You have a smaller screen. It's more difficult to click the links. All these things come into play when you're accessing a mobile device versus a desktop. Therefore, generally speaking, you want more simple and you want more pointed content. So you might want to limit the content on the mobile site because people have different questions when they're accessing via mobile versus via a desktop. All right, as far as this goes, our focus in this class is going to be on this part of the solution. How do I make one size fits all? How do I make one set of pages that are responsive? That is, that are smart enough to know what kind of device the page is being displayed on and 
adjust accordingly. This stuff, that is covered in CISS 268, mobile web development. All right, so responsive web design. There's sort of three pillars to this, and we know two out of the three already. We just have to put them into play. Number one, fluid layouts. Number two, use percentages. And number three, media queries. We know these two things. We just have to put them into practice. The one that we don't know, that we're going to be talking about in a minute, is media queries. What do I mean, what do you think I mean by fluid layouts? What have we learned in CSS layouts that, that relate to fluid layouts? Okay, not using absolute position. What sort of positioning? Relative. Maybe relative. What other way that can we accomplish layouts? Letting the browser decide, so using the flow. And the other way would be using floating, using floating layouts where you float things to the left and let the browser decide. If you remember last time or the time before, um, <coughs> when we, um, I think this was before spring break, w when we used a floating layout, we had something when the screen was very wide, it was two columns. When we made the screen narrower, it became one column. That's a perfect sort of thing that you want to do with responsive web design. That is, on a larger monitor, you might want it to be two columns. On a smaller monitor, or on a smaller device, you might want there to be only one column. Use of percentages. All right. You can use percentages for most everything. All right. We use percentages for like the widths of things. So, for example, our navigation, instead of saying a width of 200 pixels, we may have said a width of 20%. All right. Now, the one exception to that is sometimes you use minimum widths. So you could say minimum width of 400 pixels. That's, that's still OK. But you can assign percentages. You can also assign percentages to images. All right? So you can make it so that an image takes up a percentage of the screen. All right? Let's see an example of that. I'm going to go and download some images here real quick. And we'll start working on a responsive design. I didn't want to do that. I use, I use these pictures in my multimedia classes. These are pictures I took at the zoo a long time ago. So I'm going to create a web page.
And again, just for simplicity here, and I know you can't see the screen. I'm not doing anything important yet. Uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to put the CSS right in with the HTML. But again, you know that it's better to have a separate CSS file. Okay, so I have my basic HTML stuff. Uh, maybe I have my header, which contains an H1 that says... Cleveland Zoo. Then I have an article and picture of an orangutan and lion. So I'm going to make an article about each of them. And maybe I have a paragraph that talks about them. Then I have an image of them. So let me go and save this on my desktop. Call it zoo.html. There's a lion, there's the orangutan, and so on. Now the problem is if I make this smaller, I cut it off. So if I were viewing this on a mobile phone, this is what it would look like. Not a very good user experience. All right. So here's where I'm going to put some CSS in here. And I'm going to start out by making by learning how to type. And then I'm going to make Make the header have a width of 100% float left. That's going to take across the whole width. I want to make each article 
have a width of 40% and a minimum width of 300 pixels and I'm going to float it to the left. Then I'm going to say article image with 100%. What does that mean? First of all, what does the selector mean? Article image. That means an image tag within an article tag. All right, that's a different selector. So it's not going to be every image on the page. So if I had an image within the header, section, all right, like the logo of the zoo or something like that, then that, this style rule wouldn't apply to that because that's not an image in an article. So it's only the images within the article. And I say a width of 100%. What does that mean? Does that take up the size of the screen? Close. Um, also close. What it will say, in other words, the question really is, is 100% of what? Is it 100% of the full screen? No. It's 100% of whatever it's contained within. So in other words, in this case, I'm going to draw this. My articles take up 40% of the screen each. When I say the image gets 100%, it gets 100% of the article's width. So whenever I give a percentage, it's a percentage of whatever contains that element. So an article The article extends across the whole page. The article is contained within the body. The body goes across the whole screen. So when I say 40% for the width of the article, <coughs> excuse me, that means 40% of the whole screen. The image, however, is in the, ar uh, is in the article. So when I say the width is 100%, that's 100% of the article's width. So now if I look at this, it's 100% of the article's width. So if I make this smaller or bigger, the image becomes smaller or bigger. Because as the article resizes, the image is based on the size of the article. Therefore, the article resizes. Then there'll be some magic point where it won't fit, and we go to a two-layer layout. Two, they're, they're stacked vertically instead of stacked horizontally. This, in a nutshell, is a great starting point for responsive web design. In other words, this page changes the way it looks depending on the size of the screen. It responds to the size of the screen. On a wider monitor, those images are side by side. As I make my monitor smaller, and as I go to a smaller device, those things become stacked vertically. So if you can imagine this being the, the, uh, a phone and this being a desktop, the page looks different depending on whether it's being viewed on a desktop or being viewed on um, a mobile device. So this really covers points one and two of my responsive design. I'm using fluid layouts. I'm floating everything. All right. I'm not saying that this is at position 100 pixels from the top, 100 from the left. 
I'm floating it. So as the size of the page changes, the things move around. I'm using percentages, and I'm using percentages for just about everything. I didn't specify the size of the picture as being 400 pixels, for example. All right. I specified the size of the picture being 100% of the available space for that picture. So it responds to changes in the size of the screen and will look different on a mobile device than it will on a desktop. The last piece we'll cover next time, and that is media queries. With media queries, what you do is you can put right in your CSS code that says, if I'm on this kind of device, use this CSS file. If I'm on this kind of device, use a different CSS file. All right? So remember, a lot of the exercises that we've done, a lot of the labs that we've done, I've asked you to create two versions. All right? CSS1 and CSS2. I didn't do that just for practice, although it is good practice to practice different kinds of CSS te techniques. You actually can have one page get different CSS files depending on the kind of device, and that's known as a media query. And it's actually pretty simple to do, and we'll go over some examples of that next time. Um, if you are interested, if you do Googles, uh, go if you do Googles, if you, if you Google uh, CSS media query, you'll see different ways that you can do that. This is what they do, by the way, when, um, if you ever notice, if you go like to a page, like a map, a map, you go to map and there might be ads or something, and then you go and say you want to print the map, and it's a planar page. It gets rid of the ads and the pictures and all the other stuff, and it just shows you the map. You can give different. CSS if you're printing a page versus if you're viewing it on a screen. And you can give different CSS if you're viewing it on a computer screen versus viewing it on a desktop device. So that's what we'll go over next time to sort of complete the picture of this responsive design. All right, we'll see you up in lab. I did not know that. I was thinking, I was actually thinking, when you get home today, there's probably going to be like a note scrawled with bad handwriting and bad spelling, like, give me fresh tuna every day next, next month, yeah, <laughs> and maybe you get flash drive back or something. Like, your hard work back. Exactly. Or at least tell them cats can't spell. Yeah, exactly, yeah, your cats can't spell, right, we know that. Yes. Huh? You, you, you probably should, yeah. So what you can do, until we get to that point, you can do like this part so far, and then you could either Google media queries or you can, um, um, you know, you can wait till next week. We'll cover that probably on Tuesday. If, yeah, if it was a sign, I, I can look in a second here. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's due until next week. Week nine is create a page mobile. Yeah. Um, that is uh, due March 29th, so you got a little less than a week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, if, if yeah, if um, it would just be a matter of adding that little bit of code in. If you're a little late because we fell behind in lectures, that, that's okay.
Right. Well, so there's other parts of the document as well where you specify the goals, you specify who your personas are, you specify the requirements, the structure of the site, the wireframe, and then you have the, the prototype, which is like a rough draft. Well, all the pages would be completed. So, for example, you might have six or seven pages on your site. For the prototype, you may, you may, you know, you might turn in three of those pages, and they might not be all complete. You might have just like placeholder images or placeholder text, or maybe the CSS isn't quite polished enough, uh, or whatever. Uh, it would be like the difference between a, a draft of a term paper and a final version of it. Okay. You know, you, you'd make, you, you'd, you'd finish everything up, polish it up, and, and make it uh, complete.